All right, we're all set. Okay, great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the June 1st meeting of the Ames Community School District uh, Board of Directors. I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Moved. In a second. second. Now, I can't have Virbom approving and seconding it, and that's what I heard. Who else said something for seconding? Gina. Gina. Thank you. I'm trying to watch my screen. Uh, moved by Virbom, seconded by Perez. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 7 0. Director Colton, will you please read the purpose statement? The Ames Community School District commits to equity and access that empowers every individual to reach their full personal and educational potential. Thank you very much. Before we get into the agenda, Superintendent Reisner uh, has asked to take it, make a few comments this evening. Hi, thank you. Uh, I wanted to, you know, we've had um, some pretty unfortunate events that have occurred recently and I wanted to make a statement um, from the district. So as a district, uh, we grieve the murder of George Floyd with his family, friends, and community. Our hearts are broken over this tremendous loss and the unspeakable breach of the community's trust. To our amazing students, especially our black students, we love you and you matter. We will continue our work of developing critical consciousness in all of our staff to dismantle the racism that exists in our schools and in the surrounding community. We remain committed to our goal of ensuring educational equity and access to make sure that you have an education that is fair, just, and rigorously prepares you for the world you will enter. You deserve that from us. We will do our part and call on the Ames community to do theirs by demanding accountability from us and all who serve our students. We will be the change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent, Superintendent Reisner, for your comments. Mm -hmm. uh, the Equity Committee will be providing an update on their work, specifically as it relates to school resource officers under uh, board committee updates later on in the agenda. Before we get into the agenda items, I would like to read our statement regarding public comments, which follow each of our discussion items and then our public forum. Residents of the district, students attending the district, parents or guardians of students attending the district, and district staff members may address the board about any topic relevant to the district, whether on the current agenda or not. Those who wish to speak must sign up at the beginning of the meeting. Speaker participation is limited to three minutes once per item. The views and opinions of citizens addressing the board do not necessarily reflect those of the board, district administration, or staff. Students are to re speakers are to remember that Iowa law prohibits the board from discussing specific employees, students, or their performance. Student speakers will state their name and school. Others will state their name and address. And just a reminder for our um, online format, uh, please raise your hand on uh, the Zoom function uh, when it comes time, and Patrick Donovan will uh, give you access to be able to, to speak. So our first update this evening is COVID-19. Superintendent Reisner, we've, we've got a list of items here. We do. Thank you so much. So I um, have a few report outs tonight. Um, the first one we wanted to start with was um, Ames High Baseball and Softball. If you remember, um, recently the governor had uh, released a proclamation for the month of June that allowed for baseball and softball to move forward um, in high schools and um, and we are excited, I think, um, with some nerves also involved um, because we want to certainly make sure that we protect our students. So I asked um, our athletic director, Judge Johnson, 
Johnston if he could come tonight and um, share the plan that has been developed to ensure uh, safety and meet the requirements that were put in place by the Department of Education. Thank you, uh, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we've got gotcha. you. Thanks, okay. Judge. Good. Yeah, um, Jenny asked me to talk for two or three minutes on just our, our general plan of how it uh, came forth. Um, after the governor allowed us to play uh, softball and baseball. I would say at first I was skeptical that we were going to play, um, not only as a state, but maybe the CIML conference that we're a member in. And then slowly as the, the state and our communities have been opening up, it seems like there's a little bit more momentum to try to get back to some normalcy. So <clears throat> Jenny and I and, and others with a lot of input, uh, hours of input and talking with coaches and CIML membership and all that, you know, we, we wanted to um, move forward, um, kind of a cautious approach. Uh, there's a lot of rules and regulations that we're still trying to implement. Uh, today was day one, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as we get closer to that. Uh, but um, it was a cautious approach. We wanted to start uh, with um, our varsity levels and honor our seniors and our oldest kids first and try to start building schedules and then working our way down to our lowest uh, grades which is our eighth graders to some degree. Eighth graders are allowed to play summer baseball and softball in the state of Iowa. So that would have been our most, um, our lowest entry level. But then it took into consideration our CML conference and the pod that we are paired with during this shortened season. Then we had to look at comparability of who's offering what level to play. And then we just had to cross reference and start building our schedules. We have approximately five or six uh, schools in our, our pod that are only doing only varsity level competition. So we had to factor that in as far as opportunity uh, and how much we could offer on our end. Um, but that led to, we still wanted to include as many kids as possible and treat some of our lower levels as maybe more of a developmental cycle or season for them. And then if we were fortunate enough to, to move forward with um, this progressing along, maybe we could give them some inner squad games like our ninth graders and even some of our eighth graders that we're still uh, talking about um, allowing them to participate. Um, so that that is being evaluated daily. Today was day one for our kids and our coaches. Um, we are down two coaches program wide that have concerns about uh, coaching in, in this scenario. So we've got to factor that in with our coach to athlete ratio and, and where we land with that. And my goal from day one of this process has been to kind of under promise and over deliver as far as games and opportunity for our kids. I wanted to start there and, and work our way up because I've tried to predict this thing back in March. And as we all know, it just changes by the day and by the week. And then we're getting feedback today through this, through the AD world that um, some schools have had to, cancel now today at lower levels because of uh, fewer numbers out. Um, we are down about five families on the softball numbers that we projected today. And I heard from two of them that they, they have concerns about safety in general. So like I said, we're evaluating um, where we're going to land with our eighth and ninth grade kids and, and the opportunity that may arise for them to help us develop some depth and fulfill our schedules. Um, I have about 18 pages of regulations from the Department of Health, the Iowa Athletic Association, and the Girls' Union. Um, Jenny and her staff have been supporting me. Um, Jerry and Heather uh, are heavily involved with the sanitation of our facility. Um, I'm using our McFarland certified trainers extensively today with temperature checks, documentation of signs and symptoms. Um, and they're going to be with us um, daily at practice of the rest of the way through and our games to help ensure uh, that they're taking care of the uh, medical side of things. Jerry and I and Heather have kind of the, the cleansing of our facility and how that looks. And then our kids, I talked to every team today for about five to eight minutes on what they have to do to uh, do the right thing here. We're kind of under the microscope um, nationwide that uh, we're the first high school programs to allow sports. So a little bit of pressure. It's a cautious approach. Um, I've got a great assistant that uh, we're just going to be involved in this daily uh, seeking 
feedback and monitoring and uh, working with our whole staff to make sure our kids do a great job. And our biggest challenge today with the kids was just social distancing. And um, we just know kids are kids. And uh, so that was a big deal to us today to work on. And then Wednesday, the CML conference will have another meeting to talk about what the fan experience is going to look like in about three weeks when we start playing games. We, when I say we, my coaches, myself, my assistant coaches, we are practicing just a little bit longer before we start games. We wanted to implement our system, get our kids in shape. Um, our kids were not in very good shape today, and then you throw some heat on top of it already. And uh, we found out real quick that we've got quite a bit of work to do just to physically get them in shape to play. And then we're going to play the same amount of games, but we're going to condense that into the, the second half of the season. So we'll get our games in. We're just taking it a little bit more cautious than some other programs. And that's why we're going to practice, too. And I, we don't want any injuries for our kids not being in shape. So that is my kind of spiel. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here to answer. Any questions for Judge or for Superintendent Reisner? I'll just say thank you for your leadership on this, both you, Judge, and Superintendent Reisner, and all, all the coaches and the staff that are helping you with this. It is a brand new territory that we're in, but you're certainly uh, working and trying to help our, our student athletes have some uh, opportunities in this, this new day of, of normal. So thank you for, for all of your efforts and uh, trying to figure out ways to make this work. Thank you. I think we can go on to playgrounds. Sure, I, I was just holding off. It's hard when you're not in the same room. I wasn't sure if there was any other questions. I really want to um, commend Judge and not take credit for th for that. He is, um, other than me asking for a plan and, and laying that piece out, um, it's really been Judge and his assistant, Ian, um, who have done the work um, at making this come together. And, and I know Jeff has lended um, some support too, as well as Jerry and Heather. So uh, a great team effort to make this happen and ensure safety with students um, from our staff. So thank you on that. And quick, I asked Jerry just to quickly update on playgrounds. Um, some of the community may have noticed playgrounds um, being utilized. And so we wanted to uh, quickly touch on that tonight. Okay, can everybody hear me? We can. <laughs> okay. Um, I communicate with uh, Keith Abraham, the director of uh, Parks and Rec for the city of Ames, and we just work together to be able to maintain alignment with the playground facilities throughout the community. Um, Keith's very thoughtful um, with respect to the measures and the, the methods that he uses to be able to oversee his responsibilities. Um, it's not, we don't really have a whole lot to report other than that we're opening up the playgrounds. It's in, um, you know, uh, adhering to Governor Reynolds' um, mandate, and we constantly remind um, people that we come into contact with about the importance of following the CDC guidelines. I call it my speech 19. Uh, <laughs> it says, if you're sick, stay home and the other things. So uh, any questions? Thank you. Okay, Jerry. Wanted to update on um, extended school year for our special education students. We have a number um, that do qualify for extended school year that with the governor's proclamation allows us to um, provide those services as well as um, an, a math assessment that I asked Dr. Hawkins to talk about as well. So we'll start with, um, with Darcy Cousins, the special ed director. Yes, um, like Superintendent Reisner said, we do have some students that qualify for extended year services through their IEPs. And um, as soon as we heard that we could be back in the buildings, I contacted teachers and or principals to start contacting those families. Um, and 
um, to make decision as an IEP team, as a, a teacher family, make a decision on what was best for each student. And so some of the families have chosen to um, stay with consultative for the month of June or to receive services virtually through a Google Hangout. And we do have some families that will be coming into the building. Uh, we don't have any students that will be serving at the same time. We're, we're staggering them. We're just using um, fellows for now and probably in July fellows in Northwood. And they will, um, if they need transportation, they'll ride the bus again um, following the social distancing or most likely just one, maybe two students on the bus at, at a time anyway. Um, and the teachers um, have been given guidelines for sanitation, taking temperature, all of those things that they need to do. And truthfully, I'm really kind of excited that we get to start having kids in the building and start working through this with a very few amount of students. And, and Darcy, um, the total number of students uh, that we anticipate having is what? We have six students on extended year services, um, and so, um, like, and I will most likely have two starting here in June coming into the building with the rest um, hopefully coming in July. Thank you. Thank you for working with all these students and, and their families, Darcy, to provide um, this really important service. Thank you. And then Dr. Hawkins, if you um, want to talk about the middle school math assessment. Sure, be happy to. Um, you can see in the supporting documents that are linked in assembly, um, it kind of runs through both the rationale why we would need to do this math assessment, the schedule, and then the mitigation steps that are being used at the building. Um, essentially, to go through that very briefly, uh, the um, typical data that we would use um, to place fifth grade, current fifth grade students, uh, next year's sixth grade students in the option of accelerated math programming, that data uh, we were not able to access or we were not able to get our hands on that data because of school closure. Uh, so normally we would have current ISAS data or IO assessment data for students. Uh, there was also the um, consideration of um, administering a MAP assessment to students uh, yet this spring in order to um, help facilitate that math acceleration process. Um, because we were not able to um, give students those tests due to school closure, um, we do need to have some data and preferably we would collect that data prior to the beginning of next year so that student schedules can be built and they are ready and their teachers are ready to hit the ground running day one. So you can see uh, there's a schedule proposed for three days next week uh, that will bring students in or provide students the opportunity to, to come in and test uh, in staggered shifts. And you can also see both the linked state guidance that uh, was used in order to identify the mitigation steps as well as the specific mitigation steps um, being planned for uh, this in order to make sure that students and staff are kept safe. I guess I, I would be happy to, that, that's a broad overview, I'd be happy to answer any questions. What was the reasoning that we determined we still need to have the assessment this year as opposed to having people kind of self-choose? I mean, I look at this and I think about, you know, who does this policy harm? And it seems like this policy would uh, harm some people that maybe weren't able to be doing math the past month or might already otherwise have problems getting into accelerated programs. Well, my understanding, uh, thank you for the question. Obviously, we want to try to have broad screening practices so that we're um, uh, providing students the, the programming equitably and the programming that they need to accelerate. Um, last year, the district uh, chose to screen all students coming into um, sixth grade uh, rather than, so my understanding is that prior to last year, uh, the opportunity was there for students to participate in this screening, but it was not necessarily an opportunity that uh, was screened of all students. Um, so last year that occurred, 
Uh, that would be our goal again this year is to make available this testing as, as broadly as available. There are other strategies that our teachers can use when students come back if uh, they've missed out on that screening, but that gets much easier to do on a case-by-case -case basis than for an entire class. And so um, the schedule proposed uh, will be will allow the middle school to safely test. Um, uh, I believe last year there were two sections of the students that qualified for this uh, accelerated math placement. And um, so roughly 60 kids, and you can see here they've got a, a, a way to test uh, 280 students. Uh, so hopefully we'll have the ability to test all those students that um, would be interested in this option. And again, the reason that we needed to do that, um, I think, to, I hope to, to be answering your question as directly as possible, was because of the lack of data. We just don't, we don't have, the only other data set that we could have relied upon for these students would have been their fourth grade ISASP tests, which would have been um, nearly two years old by the time that, that placement came. And I think what's going to be important is um, that we ensure that students who who weren't able to access the screening tool um, be due to transportation or or whatever the family issues um, may be that prohibit them from um, being able to do that, that we offer that at the beginning of the year um, as well, because we certainly don't want to um, exclude students who don't have access. Understood. I mean, I, I would encourage us even to be a little bit more um, flexible this year to allowing students that think they can do the work and would like to get in, but maybe weren't able to test or didn't test as high as they would like to still have an opportunity because even coming back in the fall, that could be four to five months that students haven't done math potentially depending on their situation, you know. I would just hate to see somebody get missed or miss an opportunity because of that. Right. I, I, I understand the, the question. Yes, I would agree that this year we may need to look at broader parameters or more flexible criteria, uh, maybe more look more loosely at the cut score uh, that has been used in the past is what, what I think I hear you saying. And yes, Superintendent Reisner, I agree completely that we would want to provide an opportunity. We would, again, that's the beauty of being able to screen students and all students while they're in school. Um, is uh, that, that we don't run that risk of transportation or scheduling being a barrier. Again, the goal here is to get a, a broad sense of um, those students that qualify so we can start creating those sections. Again, knowing whether you need even broadly two sections versus three sections um, makes a difference in the master schedule that get, gets created at the middle school. We can certainly on a case-by-case -case basis add kids into those sections, but it would be good for our, our middle school to know uh, approximately how many sections they need to create. That's why we're not waiting until uh, July or August to do that. It's, um, I think it's, it's um, I like what uh, Superintendent Reisner said about maybe the beginning of the school year, because there could be still people not comfortable going into the school building, and because um, that could be a possibility. Um, my question is, is there a way that people could, the students could take this at home? I'm not aware of a way that the, that the, this test could be administered at home. It's not an electronic test. Okay. Um, yep. So, so uh, um, for, I think it is a, a, it's a locally developed paper pencil test that I believe has been used historically in the district in the past. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so any other questions on that item? Patrick, if you can click back or who, whoever's doing that to the next, okay, there we go. Um, so online, earn, online learning experience, um, we, this does say Dr. Hawkins is going to present that, but actually um, I, I asked Eric if he could update. The survey is not closed yet. We still have another day, but since we had a board meeting today, I just wanted to um, be able to share a little bit with you all on um, on our desire to do this survey and collect this information and then what we have so far 
uh, just big themes. So Eric um, was able to compile that in a in a pretty, I think, quick, efficient way. <laughs> yep, I hope to be. Um, like Superintendent Reisner said, we sent out a thought exchange last week, Thursday, and we sent separate thought exchanges. We sent one to our teachers and staff, um, one to our secondary students, and then we sent three different thought exchanges to our different um, parent groups. So one for elementary, one for middle school, and one for high school. And the reason why we did that is because we felt that, you know, at each level, it, it could re really be a different experience for our students and for our parents. And so we wanted to be able to pinpoint that feedback for each of our buildings. Um, as of actually just a little while ago, we had over 750 um, parents involved in the thought exchange who participated, over 300 students, and over 150 staff members participated. And so when I went through it earlier today, um, just kind of looking for some trends to the feedback, and then also the really nice thing about thought exchange is that we're able to really crowdsource ideas. And so we know that there's also going to be those nuggets, um, those aha moments of ideas that you know our parents or our staff or our students are going to share with us. And so really overall, the feedback was really constructive and helpful. So I'm gonna kind of summarize some of the trends that I saw when I went through it. Um, first and foremost, there was really a lot of appreciation for our teachers and district for being able to pull off what we did this spring. And that um, came very loud and clear. In fact, um, a lot of the top thoughts from our elementary parent groups was echoing that point. Um, and just as a reminder of thought exchange, the neat thing about it is that it, as I as a participant can go in, I can share my thoughts, but I can also rate the thoughts of others. And so you see these thoughts um, really kind of coming to the top as some of the most popular. And that was really one of the most popular ones. And then we also saw a lot of thoughts that acknowledged sort of the inherent challenges involved in learning like this. Um, you know, we're obviously going to have some students who, who are going to want more material and we're going to have some students who are going to be more and less engaged throughout this entire process. Um, we have parents who are at home who are working and trying to navigate that. I, I can speak to that and I think um, a lot of parents can about having their students at home and then navigating working and trying to be involved in this learning process. And so there's a lot of that as well. Um, once we got into the secondary students and the parents echoed this as well, you know, there's, there's going to be challenges where how do you keep students continually engaged? And I think, you know, all of these things are inherent in, in what we all went through this spring. Um, some considerations, there were some really detailed um, considerations. I saw some thoughts on how we share materials for a class and, and there's some suggestions on the timing around that, um, which I think, you know, is gonna be useful moving forward. Um, there was also a lot of thoughts around having more interactions with teachers and, and having, especially at the elementary level, having more interactions, like social interactions with students, um, with each other. Um, I think they miss that. I'm kind of gauging my notes here, kind of trying to look here a little bit. Um, and then there was also um, some discrepancies as far as there were some classes or maybe subjects, and I saw this more at the high school level, who were maybe giving more work than, than other classes. And so I think it's really fine tuning that as, as we plan for the future. Um, I will say uh, I, I did write this down because I think it echoes kind of what we all feel. There's one, I mean, this was from a secondary student. They said, I hate Corona, ugh. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled when I saw it because it's like, you know, we, I, I agree. We all want to be back in school. Um, it's challenging for, for everyone. And, and, but there was really a lot of really positive things within it as well. And so I think, Superintendent Reisner, you'll talk a little bit about kind of what our next steps are with this. Thank you. Um, I We really wanted to get this data to help us as we plan for next year in the event that we may have to um, go back to some type of online format. So hearing from parents about their experience um, is going to be helpful to principals and teachers as they um, really reflect on how their 
process went and then being able to use the most effective ways to reach students and families. Um, so, and then also we wanted to hear from our staff um, and what were the challenges uh, that they faced and, and how are they feeling now at the end of the year um, to help us as a district as we plan um, do that from a lens of this is what we've experienced as as teachers so i think this will be great um to to really refine what we hope doesn't have to happen next year but be prepared in the event that it does have have to happen but i'm with that that student that said I hate Corona because um, we certainly don't want to have to be there again next year. So that's really, um, that was the intent of this is to gather that feedback. All right. I just, I, I just want to say something real quick. So I appreciate hearing that that was kind of a, an early outcome of the, the survey. I took it as a parent and I was able to see um, at least what some of the other parents said from from what I saw it looked like a, just a complaint section right I was I was surprised to see that I, but you know understanding the situation how frustrating it was for everyone I guess what I just want to say is um, I teach online in my in my daytime job it's my day gig is teaching right? and I teach online and then I just want to say that that really that's not what we were doing here Right. We were crisis in a crisis mode response. And so while I appreciate the comment, I'm not sure if you were actually intending to um, proactively plan an online learning experience, um, because if you do that, there all of those things that were comp were brought up would be addressed in the first place right so there is a whole industry around online teaching and best practices and tools and all, all of that and so i guess all i would say is i hope you all are not spending your your time reinventing the wheel there is a science to this um that that i'm certainly ha happy to help you with resources if you need them but um i, I guess that's all i wanted to say yeah thank you for that uh, great point in that there's a difference between what we were doing in terms of voluntary and even the required mode that looks much different than if you've taken an online course um, at, at any point in, well, we hope it's a different, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and I have not looked uh, directly at this survey yet because it's not, um, it's not complete. So I will look at that and, and, you know, unfortunately, I also know that we're in a time where everybody is feeling stressed and overwhelmed and, and understanding that we give people grace and um, know that they're frustrated. So, yeah. One more piece, though, I do want to say, and I think I, we have talked about this before, is that while this might not be a really great mode for, let's say, 75 percent of our students, 25 uh, percent of our students um, blossomed. And this really worked for them for a variety of reasons. And so I don't necessarily think that once things are back to normal, this should just be something we chuck and totally forget about. I really do think there is an important um, innovation here for our district to develop that lane for students who might really benefit from this type of educational experience. Definitely. Any other comments around the online uh, survey? I guess the only question I was going to ask a little bit of a follow up to uh, Monique's comment is there, and I don't know how you would do this, but would there, will we be able to understand how many took advantage of it? So how many of our, however many elementary students that we have, how many were actively engaged or is that an elementary might be difficult because it is, um, it, because it was voluntary, but it, it, it would be to Monique's point about, you know, 25% blossom. Well, what is that percentage that did blossom with it? And, and it was a, a potentially more effective model for them. Yep. So we, um, we are collecting the data around uh, participation okay. right now as we speak. And then our, um, 
our intent is to break, we have a, a kind of a system that we're going to put into place where we break that down into and look at groups of students. So how, um, what was the access and participation rate of female students, of IEP students, of students of color, of, so all of our different groups, um, we're going to break that down. And our hope in doing that is that we're able to identify um, what groups weren't able to access it and then explore um, why that was and what we can put in place um, if ever we have to go back into this mode um, so that they have better access. Thank you. And we'll share that information with the board when it's done. Um, I think right now it may have already been collected by the buildings and Patrick is working magic on his end to um, to do the, the categories. Okay. I'm not positive if all of the all of them are back in, but that's kind of the plan. So you'll you'll get to see those results as well. And just one other thing on the online learning experience, um, Eric will put that out uh, so that we all can see those results. But again, I just wanted to um, have a quick update on that, even though it's not finished. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any other comments on that? Okay. Return to Learn plan report. Um, if you remember back, and, and I wanted to also take a minute to thank um, Director Colton, Director Franzen, and I, I'm sh I think there was one other board member that participated in our um, webinar that we did. Was there one? It was me. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. I was thinking it was, but I, I couldn't quite remember. So I wanted to um, thank you, you three, for taking the time to do that. Uh, I hope it was helpful in understanding the enormity of this um, process and um, and and kind of reaffirming that we have a lot of staff involved, a lot of teachers um, involved in this process as well. So um, I asked that Jeff. Um, make sure we give periodic reports to the board. And so uh, he has something prepared. Sorry for the delay, just trying to unmute. <laughs> um, again, excited to be able to talk with you guys about the, as Superintendent Reiser put it, the enormity of the project of creating a return to learn plan. Um, I think a really great lead in, quite frankly, Director Benkin was the conversation and the acknowledgement that the um, while it wasn't a, certainly a chosen option for us to go to an online environment, um, it really did work for some of our kids. And so, you know, uh, in the spirit of not wasting a good crisis, uh, hopefully this can be one of the things that helps transform some of the way we do our work. Uh, that aside, um, I have attached, or um, JB has attached a return to learn document that just provides a brief update. Um, again, I, I would echo what Superintendent Reisner said. I think um, those board members who were able to, to be with us to see uh, some of the planning that has gone in and some of the structure and process that's put in place for our teams to do quite a bit of uh, really important planning work. And then as you um, heard uh, that day also, Following that planning work will be lots of really important implementation work. Um, this uh, update is just intended to give you a sense of what those teams have been doing since that kickoff day. Um, you can see that for every team, um, I, I don't know that I intend to read through every single team for you because uh, it's attached there, although I, I, could, I could do that if you need me to. Uh, but I would highlight the, the big points, and that is that every team has either met uh, since that time or the leadership structure of those teams have met. Four of the five teams have broken into subcommittees. Um, or I believe the uh, SEBMH and basic needs team will be meeting tomorrow and their intent is to break into subcategories. Three of the five teams have already identified um, questions. If you remember the, the, the planning tool, the structure that was provided to them was really organized into several series of questions for them to answer about different um, models of delivery. Three of the five groups have identified some additional questions that they think are important to answer. Um, and I can tell you, uh, while I don't know that I could um, necessarily answer um, 
with a lot of specificity as I click through the tool in the last few days. One, I see very frequent usage that when I get on it, there's always people on it. There's people working on it. And many of those uh, questions are beginning to be answered. So I'm excited about the, the progress that we're making. Um, what's not listed on this page is that we've um, sent out a meeting to all of the um, DLT representatives, the uh, Superintendent Reisner's cabinet, as well as the facilitators for each group to get back together on June 10th and have some um, calibration work so that we make sure that as we move forward, um, the, the right hand is talking to the left hand, so to say. Um, and so I, I'm excited about the um, work that's being done by these groups as well as the, the questions that are getting answered so that we can um, have a, a plan that has a lot of meat to it so that when we shift our thinking towards implementation, those building level implementation teams have a lot of um, answers upon which to, to guide their implementation. Any questions for? <laughs> I was trying to unmute. <laughs> I don't really have a question. I just uh, want to say that one of my favorite things from the kickoff meeting was um, when I, I believe it was both of you, Superintendent Weissner and Director um, Hawkins, that said, don't think about implementation yet. So that I took that as a, um, as a message to be innovative and to try different things. And I know you're trying to reinvent education <laughs> for a little bit there, just to try to figure out what to do. But I really like that message, because um, that, that's what we're doing right now. So I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. I think that was Dr. Hawkins that said that. <laughs> it was good, very good. All right. Thanks for the update on it, Jeff, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to for board members to tap in on the first hour to just get a little bit more background. Uh, appreciated the opportunity for those of us that could do that. All right. Any other updates on COVID-19, Superintendent Reisner? That is, you know, it, oh, I was going to put it down under my um, today because it was a something that just was decided, but um, I'll go ahead and put it right here, just um, graduation update. Okay. Um, the, it's COVID-19 related, so we are moving forward with um, grad, a graduation ceremony. Um, it will be at Hilton. Uh, we talked about that before. The Hilton had saved several dates for us. Um, and as you know, the community had uh, families of the seniors had taken a survey and loud and clear told us they wanted a traditional ceremony um, whenever possible. So Hilton has arranged for us to have that venue on the 21st. Um, and we are currently in the process of working out the details. They're confident they can have a uh, setup um, with chairs on the floor and things for the graduates where we are uh, social distancing and then we'll have a, a cap on the number of, um, of people that can come and view it as well. So I think students will have, be able to bring a certain number of people just so that we stay under uh, the number that we need to ensure safety and um, in the building so details are are happening but um not a lot more to report out on that right now but wanted wanted just for the board to know we're moving forward and that's all i have on COVID. okay thank you okay <laughs> Could change tomorrow. <laughs> yeah uh, yeah probably will so any uh comments from the public uh, like I said, please raise your hand or uh, on the attendees Zoom and Patrick, just let me know. I do not see anybody. Nope, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, great, great. We will go ahead and move on to a discussion, a discussion item. Excuse me, and the first item is the Mediacom Channel 7. Yeah, thank you. You know, we can get started on these discussion items faster. We don't have that walk to the board table in this <laughs> format, so <laughs> we can jump right in. 
Um, I did provide some slides in the agenda, and really I'm pulling together some information to have a conversation around the continued usage of Mediacom Channel 7. So I'm going to provide an overview of what it is, how we utilize it, and then some additional talking points that I pulled together um, for this presentation. So if you're not aware, Channel 7 is our cable access channel. Uh, it's operated by us. Essentially what Mediacom does, Patrick, I'm on slide three. Thank you. <laughs> Essentially what Mediacom does is that they give us the channel to use and all of the content, all of the equipment, all of the management of that channel is our responsibility. We don't have a contract um, to operate this channel. The city of Ames also has a channel, channel 12. And this is Mediacom's Channel 7, so it's available to Mediacom cable subscribers. So kind of in a snapshot, what we have on this channel, it's, it's running essentially for us 24 hours a day. Um, we are live broadcasting this board meeting, and then later on throughout the week, we replay this board meeting as well. And then once we get to our next board meeting, We'll live stream that one and, and play it throughout the week. Um, but we also, in between those times, we have other videos, uh, short videos that come from our department. These are the types of videos that are oftentimes shared through our social media channels. And then we also have other district content. So if we had a recent listen and learn, we would play that as well on repeat throughout the, uh, throughout the week. When I was trying to estimate um, the time that we put into this channel, you know, I was having some conversations with um, other staff members, and we're looking at about five to seven hours a week. It, that goes up and down from um, a given week. I think there are some weeks that are, are more busy than others. Um, and I listed a number of things that, you know, we're looking at throughout the week. So part of it is populating the channel, scheduling it, um, working with the files, broadcast is a little bit more complicated than probably what it should be, um, than what we would be used to as a school district. Um, but we've been operating this channel for um, several years. And so if I took those five to seven hours a week um, and I put it up against an hourly rate, you know, we're looking at around eight, nine thousand dollars Could be a little less than that, could be a little more. You know, I'm just estimating um, to get a sense of the time involved in operating this channel. One of the other things that I did really look at um, when looking at, in addition to the dollar amount, is really kind of estimating what that five to seven hours a week is per week. And so we're looking at you know anywhere from a half a day um, to operate this channel for the week. The equipment um, around this is we have it in you know our, our school board. It's in that back room. Um, broadcast is a bit nuanced compared to other video platforms that we use, such as YouTube. Um, we're operating off of a dated software um, on a PC, and then our, all those files must be stored on a hard drive that eventually that hard drive not yet, but at some point is going to have to get replaced as well. One of the frustrating parts about the channel, and I asked this question, is that we actually don't have any analytics on, on the channel. So who is watching it, when they're watching it, how often. Um, I talked with a representative at Mediacom. It's not something that they track and follow, and therefore they couldn't share with us. So I did want to provide um, the other video platform that we really use. And over the past several years, we've really beefed up our YouTube channel and how we distribute video from a school district. Um, YouTube is easy to use. It's also, I always find YouTube to be a great archive for our school district. And so it has all of these school board meetings on there. And then also it's a great platform to put all of those other videos that we have on Channel 7. They're all readily available on YouTube as well. Um, that content can be easily shared. So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, we've all been on YouTube, so we can share those files through a URL in email. We can include a video, which we have done before in a thought exchange as reference. Um, they're just very easy to use. I provided a few analytics, not that this is a conversation about YouTube, um, but I wanted to provide some analytics because we do have those for the videos that we host on YouTube. And so you can see, I posted a few things from 
um, the last couple school board meetings. And then the one that really stood out was our December Listen and Learn session on PBIS, where we had over 500 total views on that. And I remember that was one of the um, videos and events that not only did we live stream that, but we shared it with our parents later on. And I think also within the thought exchange that I referred to. And so it's a really great example, at least for me, that we can really leverage how we use YouTube um, when we have really great content. So in lieu of analytics, I did reach out to my counterparts across the state. There actually are not a ton of cable access channels around anymore. Most of them are in um, larger districts and they have a staffing structure in place where it allows them to continue to use their cable access channel. One notable district in eastern Iowa um, communicated to me that they did discontinue their channel um, fairly recently in 2018 and they moved all their meetings over to YouTube and that person indicated to me that that was a very smooth transition. Um, Iowa State recently dropped their channel. I guess I don't know about recently, but they did drop their channel. They had one similar to ours in the city of Ames that they don't use anymore. And then as we as I talk to other communication professionals across the state, um, really when we're considering video and how to use it, um, districts are really looking at other options. And so YouTube is one of them, which we've already been using for years. Um, but another example would be Facebook Live and how to utilize that. And then really expanding the capabilities um, on live streaming as well, which I know is something that um, Patrick and I have talked about as well. Um, even just last year, you know, having the capability for us to live stream um, some of our basketball games, and then how do we expand um, that topic? We did talk about uh, this topic recently at a communications committee. So one of the really good ideas that was brought forth in that committee meeting was reaching out to the city and seeing if they could share some of our school board meetings or if we had other um, videos or content that we wanted to share. So I did reach out to the city. I, I knew they had channel 12. I actually wasn't familiar with channel 16. Um, but the answer that I got around channel 12 is that they have policies around that channel and they only broadcast city or city sponsored programs on that channel. So their city council meetings, for example, would be one thing that they do share on there. And then channel 16 is actually a public access channel where they accept video submissions. And so um, as I started looking into that, I was like, okay, that could be an, an opportunity as well. And then when I actually talked with the person at the city, I found out that they only accept submissions in, in VHS or DVD and they do not accept digital signals as far as video submissions. And the primary reason that was communicated to me was really budgetary reason. They just haven't put money into um, this channel to really get it more modern than anything. And so as I think about, and, and one of the reasons why I brought forth this topic is, you know, I, I think about the balance of, of time and, and how, much we, how much effort we want to put in really to all of our communications efforts, and it just happens to be this one um, tonight for this topic. And I know that we've had a cable access channel for you know, quite a while. Um, I think historically, it was a much more viable communication vehicle. Um, but now with the advent of, you know, I, I mentioned YouTube several times, but social media, um, and then with you know, you see cord cutting happening all over the place, you know, with people dropping their cable subscriptions. Um, I thought it was worth a conversation on what should our priority be for, for Channel 7, knowing that all of the information that we do have on that channel is also readily available um, in a different platform, and so YouTube. And so I'm happy to answer um, any questions. Eric, I want to thank you for the presentation because every question that I had, you answered. <laughs> I had questions on analytics for, and you answered that, and um, the city, you answered that. Just a um, quick clarifying question for me. Mm -hmm. So there is no expense that we're not paying Mediacom extra for this. This mm -hmm. is something where we are. So 
I, I can speak a couple things on that. So, um, no, we are not paying. Um, our cost right now is in time. And okay. so as I forward think into what I want our priorities to be as a district, um, that's kind of the genesis of where this did come into play. There was, and an, an I don't know that I can speak um, a lot on this topic, but I know that um, I've had conversations, brief conversations around there were some FCC regulations and a lawsuit involved. And, and ultimately, um, and this was probably a year, year and a half ago, I had a conversation with a person at the city where if things fell a certain way, that Mediacom then would be in a position to, to charge us. Now, there hasn't been a lot of conversation around that recently. Um, several months ago, I reached out to the city again, and they hadn't heard anything. And so I can't say that that's on the horizon or not on the horizon. I'm, I'm really not in tune with what mm -hmm. FCC lawsuits are going on, to be honest with you. But I just know that that was a conversation. But really, um, at least for me, it's it's less about money and more about time. And so I always think about, you know, what, what are the next projects that we want to do that can really improve our communication efforts? And so th those are really the variables that I'm thinking about. Okay. Thank you. Because Eric, are you the sole person when you say the five to seven hours a week, are you the person that manages all of it? So where this is becoming a timely conversation is, um, the person who currently manages Channel 7 has um, the great opportunity to retire at the end of this year. And so that's, that's really where um, this conversation is coming from. Okay. And so as, as we look forward, then um, we really have a choice to make. I think, you know, we, we onboard people um, to spend that amount of time for Channel 7, or we put our efforts um, in other areas. I think that I think what Eric um, originally came forward to me and had the discussion around the number of hours per week of staff time for you know what, what could potentially be something that's not really being utilized in terms of viewing. Hard part is without the data, we don't know how many people that is. So um, so that's why I think we we felt like we wanted to bring it to the communications committee and, and maybe even have a discussion at the board table like this to help make the right decision. But efficiency with staff time, um, you know, we're always looking at that. So that was, I think, what originally brought it forward. And, and I have found, you know, I, I look back at, you know, I can speak to the last three years when I've been here, and I, I feel like we've put a lot more effort into our social media. We've put a lot of effort um, into the development of a magazine. Now we spend some time on a podcast, you know, which is going to reach um, a certain demographic and probably going to have a better reach than what this cable access channel is going to be. And then as we vision for the future, um, we're looking at what improvements can we make to our website? How can we support um, buildings and communication so that um, they can reach parents in a more efficient manner, um, improving our processes overall. And so these, you know, these are the things that as we now are going to approach the summer and enter into next year, these are the topics that I'm thinking about. I can just jump in for just a second. I appreciate the conversation. I hope it does go to the um, communications committee. I hope that's going well, by the way. I don't know if I've heard anything about that one. Um, but I guess I, I have a couple of thoughts. I'm wondering, because I, I feel like there's maybe a middle ground here. Um, in a little bit, what I'm hearing is the conversation of, you know, when you're cleaning out your, your junk drawer and you find that random screw and you're like, what the heck does this go to? And nobody knows, you just throw it away, right? Um, I'm wondering, because we don't know if this is a vital connection that certain people in our community have to the district. I know there are older populations who rely on this way to connect, right? There are people who still get physical newspapers. Um, they like that. And so what I wonder is if there is, a, because we don't know and don't have a way to get kind of electronic data, could you post a notice on the channel saying, hey, if you're watching this, call us and let us know. We're thinking of cutting the cord. Like, is there a way to find out? Um, we might be surprised. 
So that's all. Those are just my thoughts. I mean, it, it will go away eventually, as will all old technology. I just don't know if now is the time or um, or not. That sounds like a good idea. The, the, we had talked about this actually did go to the communication committee, and we had recommended bringing it here for the larger discussion. I'm disappointed that we don't have a way to put it through the city because that was kind of the middle ground idea we had. Um, and then I've been thinking about metrics because we were all talking about, does anybody watch it? And then just last week, my mother-in-law told me she was watching a school board meeting. So, you know, that's one data point. But I like um, Director Binkin's idea of just putting something on there and asking people to submit something to us or let us know if um, they're watching. And also whether they're also watching YouTube or if they even know it's available on YouTube. Um, that might be helpful. And I would guess that f I'm just making assumptions here, but for the people that I'm assuming are watching on the cable channel, just a simple instruction to call. And then if there could be a staff member who gets that call and then maybe asks three, four or five questions, mm -hmm. do you know we have a YouTube channel? Do you know there's these other options? Could you access those? Like I just, that's just useful information. Yeah, yeah I agree works. with that completely. I feel like uh, we were all fairly comfortable with the idea that if this could go through the city channel, um, then that would be fine. But otherwise, we did, if I'm remembering correctly, discuss like doing the survey or trying to figure out who is using it and do those people have the ability to access um, the information in another way. Yeah, we did. We did discuss that because I know you and I both. Sabrina, you and I both had that concern about that particular demographic of people who may be watching this but don't have internet access or um, they just, you know, they're used to watching it on TV, so that's what they do. So it would be good to get some numbers on that, definitely. Yeah, and, and with my present, you know, what, as I pulled together a lot of this information, um, I would never suggest that that no one is watching it. I, I know that there are um, some people who, who rely on it. I think the really great question is um, how many of those people also could watch it on YouTube, but out of convenience, out of, you know, that, that's their norm on a Monday night, would, would maybe watch it on Channel 7. Um, it, it would be a change for some people, and, and I do acknowledge and, and understand that. I guess the other thing I was going to add is I really feel like what I would expect is that this is really part of a broader communication strategy coming from the district, right? There's a holistic strategy about communication and, and really I would follow whatever your lead is here. But again, like I, the, because the, the focus I'm hearing is on people power, right? It takes this many hours, which equates to this much money. And I'm wondering, is this not an opportunity for a student to get experience? Um, you know, is this a way for a student to get credit? Could this be some type of project, right? Does it have to be, we, you know, from the district's perspective, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. And so this is the only way we can continue to do it. Like, is there other wiggle room here to give opportunities to other people? And so I, I actually have considered, um, I have considered that. And I don't know that I've, I've I'm, I'm open to ideas and, and certainly suggestions. Um, knowing, I suppose if I were to ask a student to do something video related, I think I would suggest it would be something that could be applicable towards their future um, as opposed to uh, managing Channel 7. And so I've actually met with um, some video students, and, and I, I would be much more in not interested, but I guess it, it, to me it would make more sense to have a conversation around, hey, let's talk about best practices of video editing and how do you utilize YouTube, and then how do you um, use that video to market other you know, learning opportunities within your building um, or their learning just because all of those things are things that, you know, video is a, is a trending topic when, when talking about businesses and marketing. Um, nearly every business has, you know, social media and is utilizing video to, to some extent. And so pushing students forward in that capacity makes more sense to me. I, I just, I swear one last thing. You could just pay them. Right? We just pay them. And we pay them, and they just do what we tell them to do. So, even for me at Iowa State, 
um, with the program that I manage, my the students who I pay are always telling me I'm an old lady for wanting to use Facebook because no, you know, young hip people don't use Facebook, and I'm like, but put it on the Facebook. So I hear you, um, but you know, there are just people across all these different audiences, and it really is just up to you to decide who's going to get cut off, right? And, and I understand that, but you know, I all right, I'm not going to say anything else. Well, I, I actually do appreciate that. I, I presented to a high school class um, last year, and boy, I got a lesson in social media from those students and, and how to use it and who's using it, and so I, I just appreciate that comment. I do think it is, uh, my understanding is that Channel 7 does provide us an opportunity to, um, I understand we push them out in other ways, but our fine arts, uh, whether it's our all of our concerts and things, we do post those videos on Channel 7, right? So I do think that it... Um, uh, Some of those we do. Um, okay. And it actually added, as I was thinking about that as well in pre preparation for this, I, um, I think I need to dive in and reach out to a few more people to get a little more educated on, on copyright. Because um, I know at, at one point... Um, I, you know, we were good with Channel 7, and I think just kind of vetting that process, you know, because we are playing, at times, copyrighted music during those orchestra concerts. Um, and from, I have two understandings, and this is actually came from our legal counsel around copyright. Um, when you mess with copyright, it really has to do with what is your threshold for um, pushing the limits, you know, is the likelihood that's, you know, a school district would get sued because we played something on Channel 7 or YouTube. Probably not, but also is it worth doing? Also, maybe not. And I just don't know at this point how, um, you know, in, in 2020, how that plays into um, band and, and orchestra-related concerts. It, it very, may very well be um, fine um, per the agreement when, when we purchase the music and, and all that stuff. I would have to get more educated on that. So I don't want to, I wouldn't want to hard commit that that is something that would be able to continue to move forward, but, um, but it's also possible as well. Any other questions or comments for Eric? Thank you, Eric, for bringing the discussion to us. Uh, any comments from the public on uh, the MediaCom Channel 7 discussion item this evening? I am not seeing anyone raise their hand, so we will go ahead and go on to the next discussion item, uh, naming of the new high school gymnasium and court. All right. Um, so I wanted to have the discussion with the board around the um, naming of the new gymnasium and courts. Um, the recommendation that we are making as a district um, team is to um, name the new gym and courts the Harrison Barn um, Gymnasium and Courts at the New Ames High School. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is important to understand is that um, Harrison has represented um, Ames in, in really in a, in a, national um, spotlight and, and what he's done, um, the person that he is, um, the, the way that he has embraced giving back um, to the community of Ames and to our school district um, has been just an example of, of what we try to instill in our students um, in our school district. And, and so, you know, you can talk all day long about his, his great accomplishments in basketball, and I don't want to diminish that, um, but that is not um, what I believe to be the reason um, that, that this is coming forward to the board. I think really what, what we're bringing forward is um, recognition and, and that role model of um, giving back and what it means to a community um, when you go on and do amazing things, um, but do so in a way where you are serving others um, and, and that commitment um, and the and the grace and the inspiration of giving back. Um, I think for that reason, we are requesting that the gym be named in his honor.
Any questions um, for Superintendent Reisner? Any comments? So I think it's go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I think it's fantastic. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. He has done so much for our community. He's done so much for our district. He's he's very, very generous and very helpful. And so this is just a wonderful idea. Any other comments? So oh, oh sorry. I'm sorry, were you gonna I just one more question. Go ahead. As I was I was wondering, like I don't know. Like, cause the gift, it's not about, it's not related to the gift, which actually came from the foundation that included, I believe his wife's name. It's really just trying to honor this person who was kind of a homegrown. Okay. Just curious. Yep. Very well. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. It's really about that that spirit of giving um, and the spirit of giving back to the community that he came from. Um, I think I've appreciated getting to know um, Harrison's mom for one, but also just um, watching all of the news around him and how he, uh, how he just the heart of and the spirit of giving and what that can do um, for a community and for individuals uh, is really inspiring. And I will say, so are his basketball stats um, and his accomplishments in basketball. So by no means am I diminishing um, what he's accomplished in athletics, because um, that too has been phenomenal. But, but I think what really has touched me um, as the leader of this district is just that embodiment of that spirit of of giving and the moral character that that he possesses. Thank you for sharing that information. Does anyone have uh, any more comments? Because I want to have a process. Um, uh, I have a process question that I want to make sure we all understand. But I did not want to go to that route before anybody else had any other comments. I just had one quick comment. Um, I would be interested to know how the community feels about this. So if they would reach out to board members and let us know, I think that might be interesting information. Actually, I think people are by policy supposed to reach out to the superintendent. They're not supposed to reach out to us about this. They would go straight to the superintendent. Yeah, your board policy says they reach out to us, but if um, you would like us to put some, some type of process together, we certainly could do that. So I'm looking at the policy um, because it does say when the name or of a school or subunit is being considered, the superintendent will have responsibility for a process to gather input and then we'll make a recommendation to the board for action. So um, obviously you've made um, a recommendation, but to uh, Director Lenkaitis's point, um, certainly uh, community members, um, one of the reasons that as a board that we function um, for the most part, having items as a discussion item, one meeting followed by two weeks later uh, as a, an action item is to provide um, if there are uh, any comments from uh, community members that, that we do have that. A gift of time at that delay between a discussion item and an action item. So I would certainly encourage if there are any thoughts, Superintendent Reisner uh, would be the place to to go for that. Do we need to, um, I, I'm trying to remember, I'm sorry, Superintendent Reisner, because I know that we talked about this in our uh, policy um, to, to bring this as an action item, do we need to suspend the naming of new facilities or because the yeah, comment you, of it, yeah. Right, it says down at the bottom um, that the board may consider waiving a policy. So um, that you can, you can, and you can do that with any of your right, policies right. theoretically, but, um, mm -hmm. but this in particular, yes, um, that is where uh, you would do that. And so um, 
any other questions around policy because I did, I think I did have uh, JD add that policy yes. in. Okay, I, it wasn't there originally, so I made sure I had it open in front of me. Yeah, yeah, so it would be, that's my understanding, and I just wanted to make sure this, that it would be, uh, to bring this as an action item, uh, we would waive the policy and, and then vote on the action item. Okay, I wanted to just make sure I understood the procedure. So, any other questions or comments? I certainly would, would echo um, uh, Superintendent Reiser and then some of our board members that uh, uh, as you read through the accomplishments and the um, character that Harrison has certainly displayed and, and his level of support for our community, it is certainly something that um, is really neat to be able to celebrate. So, all right. Uh, we will go ahead and take, are there any uh, comments from the public on the naming of the new Ames High School Gymnasium in court? I am not seeing anyone raise their hand, so we will go ahead and go to the uh, next, discuss next discussion item, which is the board committee update. And does the equity committee want to uh, go ahead and start for us? You're on mute. I know, my computer's like, you're muted. <laughs> so I want to, um, first of all, just start with saying I have like two pages of notes. So I'm gonna be reading my notes just to kind of make sure that I keep the flow. Um, I have terrible internet. Uh, so if I start to uh, break up, if someone could just let me know in the chat, um, I'll go ahead and turn it on. But I guess what I wanted to say is um, I wanted to thank a particular member of the community. I won't out them by name, but uh, you know there was a member of the community who, in response to the uprising that we're wa witnessing on the news uh, right now, um, wanted to hear from the board around the use of SROs in our schools. And so, um, you know, that person taking direct action to try to improve their community had this direct result of us having this conversation. And so um, the reason that I'm giving this update is because I spoke to uh, Superintendent Reisner and I spoke to Board President Franson and we agreed that um, it would just be best if I gave this update. Now, hopefully it will be clear in a little bit. But first of what I wanted to say is that um, the equity committee has been working on this particular issue on SROs in our schools um, since we were approached by ARC, which is the anti-racism uh, collaborative in Ames, uh, a group of teachers who were very concerned about the addition of a second SRO in our school. Um, I had a conversation with some of those members in August of 2019. They came and spoke to the district. We had a meeting with them um, in which our SROs were there. Um, and then this particular year, once our new board members were seated, our new committees were established, we agreed at that time that the equity committee would prioritize figuring out the roles of SROs in our schools. And so we set about to look at the issue. And the reason that we decided to do that was because um, we, what we realized was there really was no consensus around SROs. Uh, we, everybody in the room realized we had just kind of inherited these SROs and no one could really articulate a reasonable you know, a rationale as to why they were in our schools. And so what we decided to do, um, you know, and, and then we talked about the fact that there was really no consensus around whether they should be in the schools or not. Um, there are some people who think that SROs should be in every building in full uniform. Um, they should be in the buildings but not have guns. Maybe they should be in the buildings but just not in uniform, to, all the way down to those who think they shouldn't be in the buildings at all. Um, we realized there was no kind of consensus, so then we started looking at the data, and then we realized there was no data. <laughs> so what we decided to do as a group was spend the year looking at the role of SROs in our schools. And we had some questions we wanted to answer. We wanted to know why are they in our schools? Uh, what purpose are they meant to serve? And do we want to continue um, having them in our schools or do we want to change? And so those were the questions that we wanted to establish, to, to, to be able to answer um, and then bring that information to the board to have a, a more in-depth discussion. But again, one of the things we knew was we really had no data from the district. 
And so not having any data from the district to be able to answer any of those questions, the next step was really looking at the literature. Um, and so as a group, we decided that we would engage in a very methodical process of um, data, of coming up with a data-driven, evidence-based position about what does the data of our district say about SROs in our schools? What are best practices, <coughs> excuse me, around SROs in our schools? Um, what does the research say about SROs and their effect effectiveness in the school experience? Um, what are the alternative options for safety um, and building community um, in these buildings? And so we started, hang on, let me drink some water. We got started and then COVID hit. <laughs> And so um, we decided again as a group that we would pause our work because our committee is composed of administrators at the school district. And so we knew they needed to be, um, you know, working on the crisis response instead of, you know, working on the equity committee. So we have not met, even though the board members are charged with continuing kind of gathering the research around these particular questions. <clears throat> What I want everybody to know is that we had a specific request to have a conversation around these issues, um, but the board is not in the position to have evidence-based information because the committee hasn't given it to them yet. Um, that was our job and what we had hoped to have done by now, but we haven't done it. Um, the person uh, that I did speak to told me that they felt that the issue was really urgent and that we needed to prioritize it and kind of get back to it. And so <clears throat> what I do want to do is take a moment and just talk briefly about kind of what we understand about SROs in our schools. Um, it's important to understand that SROs are not necessarily in our schools to be policing our children. That's not what they're supposed to be there for. We don't really have any data that that's what they're doing, but we don't have any data that's what they're not doing either. Um, we want to be sure that we are making data-driven um, decisions, that we're not making decisions out of emotion, that we're not making decisions based on anecdotes, that we're not making decisions based on our personal agendas, and that we're not making decisions based on pressure. We have one time to get this right for our children, and we are committed to doing that. And it will take as long as it takes for us to get it right. But I can assure you that once we do that, we will have a response that we can stand behind. We will do whatever is right for our students. You know, I have no doubt that the district is committed to that. So I don't know if we will have SROs in the school in the fall. I don't know if we won't. I'm not committed to one position or the other because I, I can't yet speak to what the data says. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I appreciate that we're having this conversation. I appreciate that the community felt um, worried enough to reach out. Um, but I want to be really careful about the way we have this conversation. I want to be able to tell people and have them understand that Black people are not a monolith. We don't all have the same feelings, we don't all have the same beliefs, and we don't all have the same reactions. And so, unfortunately, because of the way it works, <laughs> that I am the co-facilitator of the Equity Committee, what I think might tend to happen is that I have white people lecturing me about how black people feel about police in our schools. Um, and I know that can probably be a little, um, you know, make people feel a little anxious and uncomfortable, but I guess it's really okay for people who are approaching the board just to speak from your own perspective about what you think and what you believe and what you feel. Uh, and you don't have to try to take on the role of speaking for black people to be compelling for us, right? We will just listen to your story. Um, I think that it's also important to, to note that violence, particularly police violence, plagues all communities of color. Um, this is not an issue that only impacts black people, right? I know that that's what we're seeing. Certainly there is this horrific history, but I, I want us to be making decisions that impact, that are best for all of the students in our schools. And I don't want the pain of other students to be pushed out of the conversation um, as, as we go through this. And I also want to say that part of the conversation and why this is so complicated is because there's a difference between 
police brutality and police in our schools, right? Um, I don't, I want to push back against the message that black people don't like the police. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think black people don't like police brutality. And so I just want to be clear that we're having the right conversation and that we're not using a tragedy to kind of, you know, to have other conversations, right? Whether or not SROs are appropriate in our schools is a conversation we need to be having. Um, and so that's where I would like to see us going because what I don't want to happen is I don't want the board to be making decisions about policy based on personal feelings. Um, and the other thing, just a little piece, and, I, and I'll finish, is um, another concern I've, I've heard about is SROs and, and their roles in the school to prison pipeline. Um, that's actually my area of expertise. That's what I study at Iowa State. And what I will say is in almost every story um, that you read about um, SROs and their, their role in the school to prison pipeline, they come in sixth person down the line, right? And so the way they get called into a situation is after an EA failed to handle the situation, after a teacher failed to de-escalate, after a principal failed to de-escalate, so on and so on. So the police actually come in later down the, the, the line. And so really, if what we're focused on is making sure our children are safe in the school environment and don't encounter law enforcement, our focus needs to be on, on our teachers and our staff, right? Because if we don't do that and we only focus on the police and we only focus on getting the police out of schools, we're still going to have teachers who call the police on our students, right? They're just going to show up <laughs> out of nowhere. And so while it may be well-intentioned, we haven't actually solved the problem. And so I guess what I want to say to the community is that I want you to know that the equity committee is taking this issue up. We're taking it up seriously. We understand that it's complicated. We understand that it's nuanced and it might be slow, but I just want you to know that we will get it right. So thank you. Thank you, Director Bankin, for providing that update from the Equity Committee. Uh, any other updates from any other committees? I believe facilities meets this Wednesday. I'm sorry, Elisa, I just want to be sure, because part of the what the policy calls for is that um, certainly the co the facilitator is required to give an update. I'm sorry. But yeah. the other board members are able to give an update if they choose <laughs> thank to. You. I don't want to exclude them. Yep, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see, I believe it's Sabrina and Gina. Anything that you want to add? I don't think I could say it any better than Director Bankin did. <laughs> okay. I was thinking the exact same thing. Great. And, and I appreciate, Director Bankin, that, that we were able to, between you and I and Superintendent Raisin, we were able to talk because we did believe it was important uh, to share um, with our community to provide an update that, yes, those discussions had begun, that research had begun, um, and, and it will continue to go. Uh, we are just really, as we have discussed, um, trying to be mindful of the things that are pulling at our administrative step. It does not mean it is not an important. It is absolutely um, something this board is committed to learning more about. Uh, but we, um, we have this massive return to learn plan that, that is due in, in four weeks. So thank you very much for reporting on that. Any, any other board committee updates? I'm not hearing anyone speak up, so we will go ahead and uh, any comments from the public on our board committee updates? I'm not seeing anyone wave their hand, so we will go ahead and move on to the public forum. If anyone wishes to speak from the public, if you'll go ahead and again raise your hand and we will uh, call on you. And I don't see anyone. Patrick, do you see anybody desiring to speak this evening? Nope, I do not see any hands raised okay. at this time. Great. Okay, thank you. I will go ahead and move on to the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. Sure. 
Uh, moved by Perez, seconded by Shields Cook. Superintendent Reisner. I just need the um, gifts to the district pulled up. Thank you. Um, Kiwanis of Ames, Gary Botin, Delta Kama Gappa, Fairway Gamma, sorry, Fairway North Ames, Bryn Richardson, Tang Chiao, Angie Deward, Alyssa Franson for school board, Suzanne Suzanne Rock, Paul and Mary Ann Lundy, and Delta Kama Gamma. Kappa Gamma. All right, it's been moved by Perez, seconded by Shields Cook to accept the consent items. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 7 0. We'll move on to action items. The facility use agreement with the Ames Cyclone Aquatics Club. I move the board approve the facility I move the use board agreement with the, the Ames, <laughs> with the Ames Cyclone Aquatic Club for the lease of the swimming pool and the new high school. Second. The beauty of virtual meetings, right? And delay. Thank you. So it was moved by Beer Bomb, seconded by Shields Cook. Uh, Superintendent Reisner and uh, Chris Denson. You want to provide some information for the board here? Sure, this has been um, months, maybe years in the making. Um, actually, years probably. <laughs> so, um, a great collaborative effort, I think, um, to to come up with this. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna thank everyone that was a part of it because um, a lot of time and energy has been spent on this and getting it right and. Um, and, and I, I think we did that. And so um, just to highlight, I think really the only, um, we, we flushed out a lot of little things um, together. And we also have um, our attorney that worked with us on this on the call tonight too, if you have some questions. But I think um, you, the, really the, the major change was um, around the rent um, and that went up just a little bit uh, if, if in looking at that. So um, other than that, there was a lot of little changes that occurred um, that really aren't, they're more logistical changes in how we operate together for scheduling and, and those types of things. Um, I don't know if... Um, uh, if Chris Stenslin wants to um, say anything as well. If I might, um, just yeah. the, the reason that the rent went up slightly, it was, it was kind of a swap. Look, originally, we had um, rent at $85,000, and then there was um, $250 per weekend event where there were outside parties, so in other words, swim meets. And so we negotiated to have the rent be a little higher up front and not have the cost for those weekends. So they get up to eight of those weekends per year for swim meets where we have to provide the custodial services and so forth that's included in the rent. But the rent went up then by $1,000 from our original MOU. And Carrie Weber is on the call and she made sure we had all of our I's dotted and our T's crossed to make sure everything was legal and so we appreciate all her work on this. So the the rent it's eighty five thousand. Eighty six thousand. Eighty it was originally eighty five in the MOU. Okay. And, and what, during negotiation and then they were gonna pay for those weekend swim meets for the custodial services. And so we negotiated that into the rent up front instead of a, a per event fee. Got it. I see it. Thank you. What about the usage of the facility? Can you speak to that? So they're entitled to 1,700 hours of usage. Each summer we'll, we'll sit down um, their um, coach and um, board and Jerry and I and the superintendent will sit down and we'll figure out where those hours are going to fall through the year. Okay. We also need to know those weekends where they're going to have those swim meets so nothing else gets booked into there. Um, and obviously during the school day is reserved for us. Um, and during the swim seasons are reserved for us. We have first choice. 
So they work around our swim season, swim practice, our swim meets, um, and, and during the school day, if we need to have um, classes in there, uh, for instance, through the special ed program. Thank you. Chris, I have a question. Um, this, so I, I, it feels like it's changed a lot. Um, so I guess part, in terms of the hours, so I'm reading the part where it says three hours before school, two hours after school. Had it always been three before and two after? That feels different. Um, I know we did negotiate some of that and you're really testing my memory. No. Um, we wanted to make sure that, that we had adequate time Time to get the pool ready for our programs, but they also had a history of practicing. So it was, and Carrie, please jump on and help me if you remember the history on this. But um, it was in line with what they had already been doing in the city municipal pool, which also corresponded with our hours as well. Um, as far as the agreement changing significantly, to me, other than the $1,000 of rent and trading it for those weekends, uh, it was really the, the legal ease that we needed to get into the agreement that, that really changed from the MOU, making sure that we had a prop that, that um, all of their usage was going to be in alignment with their 501c3 status because we eventually will issue 501c3 bonds to finance this facility through sales tax, um, making sure that there's a process for background checks, um, the um, ability for them to do concessions and signage and so forth. Carrie, can, uh, is there anything else that you can think of that significantly changed from the MOU? I think you explained it very well. I mean, the reason that there there's so much difference here is because this is the actual lease itself, whereas before we were just in the planning process of, of thinking about that lease, and it was more hypothetical at that point. So like Chris said, uh, there's just, you know, the details are here that weren't there before. And I think in terms of the hours specifically, the way I remember it, I believe we originally had something like a reasonable amount of time before and after school. <clears throat> Excuse me, and ACAC requested uh, a specific number of hours in there. And I think we had a lot of back and forth about how specific to, to be uh, to guarantee both, both parties, um, you know, what they wanted to get out of the agreement, but at the same time give you the flexibility to still uh, operate and, and, you know, um, be flexible as unforeseen circumstances arise. So there's some back and forth there about how detailed to be and how uh, generalized to be within the agreement. Are there meets? Oh, I'm sorry, Jim, I just have a few more questions. So I just want to understand then, so the agreement, in terms of the school day, right? Uh, I guess maybe in terms of, a, of an actual day. So ACAC is going to use it and then the school district will use it when it's swim season, and then maybe we'll use it during the school day for PE, and then it'll go to the swim team, and then it'll go back to ACAC. Am I, is that the flow? Am I understanding that right? That's pretty good. I mean, that's pretty close. <laughs> that's, that's very close. So that's very in, close, yeah. During swim season, my understanding is they have both morning and afternoon practices. And so that's where those hours... Um, I think at some point, to, to be real candid, I think the reason we ended up with putting the hours in there is that there was some uncertainty of um, the usage by the city and AC's, ACAC's concern that if it wasn't specific in the, the agreement that they may get the 9 to 11 p.m. slot, which is not conducive to their program. So I think that that was one of the reasons that they wanted to kind of lock those in, that it wasn't a restriction on our programs at all. It was to get those prime swim hours when we were not using it. And so then that was my next question. Is there an expectation that the city will be using it? Because I think the city is the way in which the public has access to the pool, right? So I, that's I don't want to ask, is the public going to have access? I'm going to ask, are there plans for the city to have access to the pool? I think I'll let Elise address that. Sure. <laughs> so um, I, I 
think the first thing to state is is that it, this is a bigger facility than we have had, and and so uh, certainly there have been conversations, and, and we had conversations with ACAC of, um, you know, wanting to be able to provide opportunities for the public if it is desired by the city, and I think that that's the the biggest thing is is that um, the city is navigating what their indoor aquatic facilities are going to look like, and so they're they're still needing to land on um, what their plans are going to be. Uh, but certainly, in working with ACAC and desiring, um, then you know they come they're coming forward uh, desiring to lease this agreement and and quite frankly helping us financially in terms of the eighty five eighty six sorry. <laughs> the $86,000 that helps us with those um, operating expenses. So, um, yes, we continue to make that, um, uh, make them aware that it is. We do need to uh, continue to be aware that um, how we navigate this, that the city is going to have to navigate and figure out where they're going, but um, honoring, and your question earlier about the hours, in fairness to ACAC, that we're not going to say your 1,700 hours are going to come after 9 o'clock at night because that is not recognizing, um, you know, that's not what they need to be able to have the programs that they desire to serve um, many of our, our students that are a part of their programs. And one of the things that we did have in mind and the reason that we will schedule those hours, I think it's, I think we're supposed to get together in July each year before the next school year to schedule those is that once those hours are scheduled, then that then tells other entities that might want to use the pool what hours are available so they can plan their scheduling. Yeah, we were, uh, the, the July meeting for our staff, Jerry, Jenny, whoever our staff is representing the district and meeting with them is, is an important time to navigate what, uh, what that schedule will look like. Chris, uh, you mentioned about meets. How many meets did you say a year? For ACAC? Mm -hmm. Um, they are guaranteed eight weekend meets for their base rent. If they desire to have more meets with outside and we're talking outside parties because that's when we have to have additional custodial there if it's just acac they're responsible for their custodial but if they're inviting out outside participants then we require our custodial to be there um, if they desire additional then they will pay based on that um, fifty dollars an hour or well, there's two different things. There's if they want more than 1,700 hours, it's $50 per hour, and then the weekends I still believe carry are $250 for the weekend. Thank you. Sorry, I messed that up. It's paragraph six. If anybody is looking at the document. And uh, okay, and where is the meet part and and the um, agreement? It or it's not in there because of the hours. Is the meet added to the hours? I I can't find the the I, I meet part. Carrie, if you could find it in the document, it's, we don't call them meets, we call them. It's also paragraph six. I think some of the confusion is we did not call them swim meets. We wanted to be clear what we were talking about. Uh, and so <laughs> I shouldn't say clear because obviously it's confusing. But what we wanted to do was specify that a meet is an event with third party attendance. So like Chris said, when those outside individuals come in, that's what we were classifying as a swim meet. Patrick, it's the other one. It's, yeah. It's the other document. So in paragraph C, mm -hmm. do you see it there? The yeah. rate includes mm -hmm. use for up to 1,700 hours, including events with third party attendance on up to eight weekend days. That's perfect. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks. Any other questions? Do we know as of yet? It, it looks like the document would allow, the contract would allow ACAC to offer swimming lessons um, that could potentially then be available to the public. Do we know if that's part of their initial um, consideration right now? I, 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 I can't speak to, go ahead, Chris. 
They did express an interest in that, and it is part of the agreement. I will say it's within their 1,700 hours, so it's not in addition to that. Um, so that was the extent of the, the conversations we had. They wanted to make sure it was an option. I don't know that it's planned immediately. We had some discuss. We had quite a bit of discussion at one time. I mean, it's been a while back, but about um, the potential of doing it through our school. So we would we would provide swim lessons, let's say, for a six week period for all of our fourth graders. Or um, we did talk about that at one point. Um, and they had talked about the fact that they have certificated lifeguard that can teach those. But that was the, that in terms of swim lesson, because we as a district want to make sure that we have the availability of the pool to use during the school day for programming as well. So we did have a lot of discussion around that. I mean, not a lot, but we did talk about that. I think that'd be something to keep track of going forward because as we said, the city doesn't have a clear path forward on swimming facility during the winter. Um, I'd still like us to have some way that um, children within the district can get swim lessons during the winter after the new high school is complete. So either through the district or through ACAC. And I think those would be two different options. One is the program that we would initiate, and another would be, I think, ACAC's desire to provide swim lessons for a fee. So oh, I think yeah. they're, they're, they're two, two programs that we've talked about. Yeah. Thank you, Chris, for clarifying that. Yes. Okay. One more thing, then. It's kind of regarding this. If we're looking at... Now, um, B schedule, and then we go to number five. Can you pull that back up, Patrick, so that the rest of the board that don't, doesn't have it open can see it? The, the part that I'm just curious about is that the part that says swimming pool facility during reasonable hours in the range of three hours prior to the start of the, the school day through 10 p.m. What are we saying here? That they could use it during the school day? I just I'm sorry, wanted... Jeanette, what, what paragraph are you on? I'm I... sorry. It is uh, uh, the point. Is, so it's B, it's schedule, and it's five. There you go. Got it. And it's the, the part that it's the time. It says during reasonable hours in the range of three hours prior to the start of, of the school day through 10 p.m. So I, I read it somewhere else that it's, prior and after, but this some, sounds through, it sounds like they could use it during the day? No. I would just say, I, I, don't, I don't know that on non-school days or school breaks, yes, I think usage during a, like what would, a Monday at 2 p.m. would be possible. So what we're saying is that's the range. However, the district has priority during all those times that we previously Said, when school's in session, when um, you're using it for your swim season, but during times when the school district is out or, or not in use of the facilities, there is some flexibility there for ACAC to use the pool during a, a normal weekday hour, and that would all be decided in that July meeting. I, I know, Director Colton, that they were specifically interested in winter break. That's a big um, time for them, for their club um, and when they schedule a lot of their hours. Okay, thank you. I just don't want it to like be confusing. Any other questions? I think I would, um, when Superintendent Reisner said it's been years, it has been years. <laughs> this has been a very long conversation going on back and forth. Um, and I, I, I think the staff, uh, Jerry, Chris, uh, Superintendent Reisner, uh, Carrie, has been a wealth of information and, and advice for us as we've navigated this. I would also thank um, Jason Horace, Jeremy Galvin, uh, Coach Mike Peterson, 
uh, Frank Feomeyer, they were some of the individuals that um, met with us and then met with us again. And, um, and uh, so certainly appreciate everyone's willingness to keep coming back and forth to it because um, as Chris said, well, wait, which one? Because we have been, th there were so many versions. And so um, the staff, Chris, I don't know if I mentioned you earlier, I'm sorry, but also Chris, but just um, the amount of work that, that the staff has put into this, we, we really, I really appreciate uh, your efforts on this. So, any other questions or comments? All right, it's been moved by Beerbaum, seconded by Shields Cook. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 7-0. Thank you. Revised 2020-2021 school year calendar. I move the board accept the revised 2020-2021 school year calendar as presented. Second. Moved by Bacon, seconded by Perez. Discussion? Superintendent Reisner, do you want to give a little highlight of what we're looking at here? Yep. Thanks. So um, not a lot of change to this. The the changes to note really are um, school was a re was originally going to start on the 26th. We moved it up two days. So it will begin on the 24th for grades first through fifth orientation for sixth and ninth grade. Um, or students who are new to the district will also happen on the 24th. Um, and then, so it's a similar setup as it was last year, um, just moving it up two days. Uh, the, the other highlight I would say um, would be that November 25th through the 22nd, or sorry, through the 27th, that is the Thanksgiving break. So the day, um, the 25th is an additional day to that break. Uh, we originally get out half day and we're um, giving that as a full day um, off of school. And then the same with December 21st through January 1st, um, the day before that day, but before um, the holiday break, we are, that will again not be an early release, it will be a full day off. And the reason that we are doing that is because that allows for us to start on that Monday, um, two days earlier than what we had um, put in the original calendar. So I'm hearing this conversation about the calendar and I, I am thinking, you know, this is, I, <laughs> I literally can't, like, we have not really all officially been outside since before spring break. <laughs> <laughs> like her, I know, right? Like, like yeah. is it possible? I'm, is it really gonna happen? So okay. I'm looking at this, and I learned something. My kids keep asking me, and that's what's the last day of school officially? And I'm like, oh well, I know it was tomorrow. So good to go, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Any other discussion about the revised school year calendar for next year? And just so you know, we did, um, I think I mentioned this before several meetings ago, but we did um, get, this did run through the union. And so the teachers um, had an opportunity through that, through the, through the union to give feedback on it as well. Okay. All right. It's been moved by Bank and seconded by Perez. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes seven zero. Uh, item C, New Ames High School change order number four to bid package zero five dash one. I move the board approve change order number four to Core Structural Services LLC in the amount of five thousand dollars for bid package number zero five dash one concrete foundations precast and steel for the new high school project. Second. Moved by Shields Cook, seconded by Colton. Discussion? Jerry, I think this is one of those fun deducts. Any comments from you? Yep, just wanted to reiterate, it is a deduct of $5,000. And this is just basically uh, working on scope review. And uh, we found an, an area where the difference between the site 
the original bid issuance number one site work package and the building construction bid issuance number two, we found a little bit of, a, uh, of an overlap. So we can eliminate that um, with this change order. And it's related to foundation drain tile work. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 7-0. Item D, New Ames High School change order number two to bid package 23-1. I move the board approve change order number two to ACI Mechanical Inc. in the amount of an addition of $23,126 for bid package 23-1 mechanical and plumbing for the new high school project. Second. Second. Moved by Bankin, seconded by Shields Cook. Discussion? Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. This change order combines four uh, separate issues. Um, the first issue has to do with the 20 inch storm line. Uh, that piping was originally um, attempted to be located in the, uh, the north edge of the gym or along the north wall of the gym in the storage space. But with the additional lines, we've got geothermal lines and we've got uh, uh, some other piping that runs along that space. We were going to, there's two things that that was going to impact. And that was, one of them was going to be the uh, structural design for the precast as this, as we got to, we need to create openings for these pipes to be able to go through the wall. And then the other thing is with, once you start putting all these big pipes in this space, then we actually lose a certain volume of that space that we can use for storage. So we're going to be able to move that or push that 20 inch storm line out to the north side of that uh, gymnasium wall and we're going to bury it underground instead. So it's a common construction type and process. Uh, but we'll just be able, that's going to assure us that we can have good adequate storage, uh, something in a building that some, sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, the second issue was we found a place in the specifications where we had something specified twice. Uh, lavatory sinks were included with the countertops and then in one section of the drawings or in the design, but they were also specified as a separate under countertop mounted um, lavatory. So we found that, recognize that, and then we, we're gonna take a deduct for that. So we only need the one sink for each of the lavatories. Uh, the next item has to do with the hydronic pipe sizes. Um, the hydronic pipes is that uh, the piping uh, that pushes water throughout the building. And the water is either hot water, it's heating, heating water or chilled water, and that is what distributes heat or cooling throughout the building. And as we went through the shop drawing process and finalized the equipment, the fan coil units, which is the kind of the end of the line, it has a coil in it and then the air blows through the coil that's either got hot water in it or cool water and that's what heats or cools the room and when we when we got to the fine detail of finalizing the selection of the equipment and then matching the uh, proposed or the designed pipe size to fit that equipment um, this change is going to make a match up a uh, couple things that the engineers have to pay attention to is the volume and the flow rate and so in order to be able to maintain the adequate volume and flow rate within the design, we need to get these pipes to match up. And so that's what this one uh, accounts for. And this change here is uh, for the entire building. So um, it's pretty incidental, I think. Uh, and the last item is uh, elevator sump discharge. And this is a city of Ames code requirement. We have to, to separate, separate the discharge of an elevator pit sump so that it, uh, it can't go into the sanitary um, sewer system. So we have to, to reroute that and provide a, a separate piping and, and drain in order to be able to get that to discharge in accordance with code. Questions? All right, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes seven zero. Uh, item E, New Ames High School change order number five to bid package 31-1. Uh, 
I move the board approve change order number five to Construct Inc. in the amount of an addition of $13,059 for big package number 31-1 site development for the new high school project. Second. Moved by Beerbaum, seconded by Bacon. Discussion? Anything you want to say, Jerry? This just uh, ties up the bow on the um, two items that we discussed previously okay. with the relocation of the storm sewer. Part of it's underground under the building, which is included in the, the mechanical or plumbing scope. And then an also part of this is an extension to be able to, to um, on the site, which is outside of the building. And so that's in the, the site utilities or the site development scope. And then the other one was to transfer the drain tile scope into this package so that it's all in one under one contract. And as we did that, then they're able to, to review and make sure that we got um, all of the required scope. So this is a little bit, this is more than what the deduct for the 5,000 was, uh, but it has to do with the increased amount of scope. So it still is gonna be more efficient and more economical to do it uh, under this form of um, distribu distribution. Okay. Any questions? It's been moved by Beerbaum, seconded by Bacon. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 7-0. Uh, items from the board. Anybody have anything? I wanted to thank our community and thank Superintendent Reisner, as well as the police chief and the chief of the Iowa State Police for um, the statements that they put out this week. I think that they're very supportive and I really, really appreciate them stepping up and saying something. Anyone else? I also wanted to thank Superintendent Reisner for um, making a statement at the beginning. I think it's just, um, very, very important that we make it clear as a board and a community that we affirm and are 100% behind um, that statement and the work that we're doing as a district and that we're going to continue to do that. Any other I, um On your agenda, you'll see that it says June, July board meetings. And in our discussions um, during agenda setting, uh, we realized that our July, uh, we have a, a meeting on July, I think it's, or it's, pardon me, June 15th, I think it's the 15th, um, but then our next one um, would not be until July 6th. The challenge with that is the return to learn plan that the staff is working really hard to put together is due July 1st to the governors and to the Department of Education. So we were looking at if we could rather than a meeting on July 6th, which actually may be a part of is connected to the holiday weekend, if we could move that meeting up to June 29th so that the staff would be able to provide for us um, closer to that date rather than just in two weeks um, all of the information that they pulled together for the return to learn uh, plan because they only have four weeks and so if we take two weeks out of that time uh, we want to give them that as much time as possible um, does anybody have any objection objections to adjusting the calendar in that way our meeting calendar no i'd be supportive of it okay Great. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Then we will have uh, JD, if you can go ahead and make um, that change to our board planning calendar to indicate that our meeting, rather than July 6th, that will be uh, rescheduled, moved up to June 29th to accommodate the return to learn planning. So, any other things from the board? All right. Items from the superintendent. First, thank you so much for giving us that extra two weeks that we desperately need. So I appreciate you all um, making that work. Thank you. Just wanted to touch on a few um, little items here. Danielson training. So 
I want to talk just a minute about um, the instructional framework. You've heard me talk about it before, just the need to have an instructional framework. And today we had um, a training that I believe all of our instructional coaches um, and district level um, administrators and building administrators all attended. And um, we all reflected this afternoon, or a number of us reflected this afternoon on what um, what a great experience it was, and how well that it that the framework aligns with our equity work. Um, the the whole kind of foundation of this um, of this instructional framework really was presented to us. Um, during the training through an equity lens. And I think we all felt really um, excited about about that and um, had some good conversations with Dr. Jones um, about that alignment and um, and just the, the power that that'll bring kind of everything together. Um, and I did want to let the board know that I will um, give you an overview of um, I'm learning it right along with the staff. I'm not, this is not one that I have used in the past. So um, I'm, I'm right alongside the staff in, in my learning, but I, I want to give the board an overview, kind of similar to what they did today, um, a condensed version. Uh, and so I'll plan that, which leads right into the next item. Um, and so I'll, uh, we can go ahead and discuss both of these because they're on the agenda so, so we can have discussion around them. But um, the summer board work session, I was hoping we might be able to have um, a three, four hour work session um, in August when we can review our board priorities and goals. Um, we'll have some data. We won't have the state assessment because, of course, we didn't take it, but we will have um, panorama survey data and other data points that we can um, do some review around those goals and and also prevent, present um, some of the initiatives in maybe a little bit deeper dive. Um, and one would be that Danielson framework. Um, I'd like to be able to present it to the board um, in a deeper session rather than just a, um, a hit on it during a discussion item. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there for discussion um, and, and see what your thoughts are on that. Any thoughts from anyone on the summer board Good idea. session? Not the Danielson training. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's or great either. <laughs> yeah. I can have a, 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 a great idea. A tangential question. Um, so I guess because I appreciate and hear you saying the Danielson training has an equity lens. We're going to have a summer board work session where we review our purpose and priorities. Are, aren't we at the end of our contract with Daniel and Katie? What's going on with that work? Will that still be a part of the district moving forward? Yes, great item. <laughs> that leads me right to the next item. <laughs> So Katie and Daniel, um, we were at the end of our, this would have been the end of our um, Katie and Daniel time, but because of um, the being out of school and um, the pandemic, we did made the decision alongside Katie and Daniel to um, put a stop to it until we come back in the fall and then they will pick up where they left off and we will um, continue into the fall. So um, we're, we're pretty excited that we'll gain a whole nother um, semester with them. And, um, and then equity audits are happening this summer for the elementaries. Um, which again, I'm I'm very very um, happy about that. So Daniel, Katie, and one of their other um, one of their other people that works with them on those um, will conduct those equity audits for the elementaries this summer. So we'll have that information as well to review when we look at our um, goals, our priorities in the fall. So I think that'll be really helpful. Is that something that will be, will the elementary equity audits be ready by the summer board work session? I'm not or sure. Fall? Okay. I'm not sure. 
I hope that would be okay. my hope. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> nope, I just was waiting to see was there any more questions. I can't see everyone's face. I apologize. Um, and then if not, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the panorama survey. Um, we reviewed the panorama data. We had a, um, a session to review the data through an equity lens um, with panorama and um, and so our administrators did that they're in the process of planning um, how they'll go through this with their staff and then um, we will share it out with the board and with um, the community and so that was another item um, that I was hoping we could do at the board work session um, the results were uh, we we had equity embedded in in this um, a little bit differently, and so we got um, some great information. Um, one thing I can say is that the the goals that we set um, during our district goals, um, we made we made improvement on all of the goals that were set um, through the panorama survey. So. Um, that was something to to celebrate, and and I want to be able to go through that in a in a deep dive with the board as we look at our priorities. Um, I just want to comment on the panorama survey. I'm, I might be misremembering, but from what I recall, that really also hit right around COVID time. It did. I remember seeing it in my email, and I think I finally just deleted it out of just, I can't even, right? Yeah. So I'm curious how how many people completed it compared to the past, and just, you know, I'm sure we'll get all, the, all that information, but I, I wonder if I was the only one just too overwhelmed to even sit through it, so... We left it open um, a lot longer than we had anticipated so that so that people might want to come back to, <laughs> I'm not calling you out, Monique, for not, but because <laughs> some people then were able to do it when, when they felt like they could get their feet under them. But um, I, you know, one thing I don't recall was what was the participation rate. So I apologize for not knowing that, um, but we will, we'll, We'll definitely go through that. Um, I think we had a larger participate. Is, did I hear a voice? It was mine. I apologize for interrupting you. you. Would you like me to share uh, those data points? Sure, absolutely. Do you, no, you don't need them, Monique. We don't need them. Okay, okay. never mind. Um, so anyway, that I was hoping to be able to do that in conjunction. So um, JD did put a date um, there to get feedback around for a board work session, but um, really my hope was to have it in August, kind of that first week of August uh, when I have my administrators back because I wanted to have some presentations from them as well and then um, try to do it before they start with their staff trainings. That's, and that's the, all I have. Thank you for the update and for providing all that information. Any other questions? I don't want to cut anyone off if anyone had a question for Superintendent Reister on those updates. Okay, uh, the board planning calendar, uh, we, uh, went, uh, like I said earlier, we will make that adjustment to the uh, calendar for um, for the upcoming board meetings. Uh, one thing that did get called to my um, attention, and uh, board members, if you could, I think we need to make sure, I'm not quite sure, I think our rotation on agenda setting for that additional member, uh, we may have gotten off. Um, and so, board members, if you'll just let me know if you if you haven't been in the rotation as much, you should be doing it um, every couple of, of months. But I will, um, Superintendent Reisner and I and uh, JD will um, have a discussion to make sure that our rotation is um, in the manner that it's. I think that when we were doing agenda setting and board updates um, in the transition of that, we got off of our, our cycle. So there, I just want to let you know, there may be some adjustments coming in your agenda uh, setting time when you're the other member, um, but we will have JD email that out to everybody. Alrighty. Uh, I don't see anything else on the agenda, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. 
I move we move. adjourn. Second. Moved by Shields Cook, seconded by Perez. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 7-0. Everyone have a nice